Okay. So following this talk, there'll be an opportunity to ask Sophie questions. And Sophie is elected to do with those herself. Uh, what we would like for you to do, please, is for you to put them in the chat box and she'll either address them as uh, you raise them or at the end of the session. But before we go any further, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to our speaker. So many of you will know Sophie Hanna, but just let me recap. So Sophie Hanna is a Sunday Times and New York Times best-selling writer of crime fiction, and she sold millions of copies worldwide. In 2014, with the blessing of Agatha Christie's family and estate, Sophie published a new Poirot novel, The Monogram Murders. It's a fabulous book. Please read it, uh, which was a bestseller in more than 15 countries. She's since published three more Poirot novels, all of which were Sunday Times top 10 bestsellers and also international bestsellers. In 2013, Sophie's novel, The Carrier, won the Crime Thriller of the Year Award at the Specsavers Natural Book, National Book Awards. And last year, Sophie's standalone thriller, Haven't They Grown, was a top five Sunday Times bestseller, as well as a Richard and Judy book club pick. It would be very hard to avoid Sophie's novels. <laughs> There's no reason to, please, please, please read them. Um, recently, Sophie's helped to create a master's degree in crime and th thriller writing at the University of Cambridge at the Institute of Continuing Education, and she's the course director of this. Um, so I'm going to pass on to her now, um, and she's going to give us a talk, wonderful title, um, Optimism for Beginners. Over to you, Sophie. Thank you very much. Um, it is absolutely lovely to be here and talking to you all. And um, thank you to Lucy Cavendish College for inviting me to do this talk um, and for being an amazing place to be an honorary fellow. Um, I've, uh, I've been associated with Lucy first as a, I don't actually remember even what my first thing was that I was, but anyway, now I'm an honorary fellow, but I've, my association with Lucy goes back to 2010 when I first moved to Cambridge, and it's just been one of my favourite places ever since. So I'm delighted to be talking at Lucy, even though I'm not actually physically at Lucy, I'm in my house, but I'm spiritually at Lucy as I'm talking to you. Okay, we are going to talk about optimism for beginners. Now, don't worry if you're already optimistic. <laughs> and if you're not a beginner at optimism, you can still listen to the talk. But I reckon that even if you think you're a long-standing and practiced optimist, there will be things that I'm about to say that you won't have thought of in connection with your own optimism practice or uh, tendency. Uh, so you, you may not be a beginner when it comes to, to being optimistic, but there will be things that you're going to hear which you probably will be in a beginner relationship to, because I look at optimism in a very different way from most people. The reason I chose the title For Beginners is because one of my poetry collections is called Pessimism for Beginners. So um, when I want to talk about optimism, I just, I like to, you know, on reflection, when I decided to call my poetry book Pessimism for Beginners, it was a good title and it was kind of memorable, but it really didn't represent my attitude to life at all. I am absolutely 100% an optimist. And so I like the opportunity to, to balance out my pessimism title with an optimism title. Okay, so what is optimism? If you want to, you can put some thoughts about this in the chat. You don't have to. I don't like to do the kind of talks where the audience feels they have to participate if they'd rather not. But if you're the kind of audience member who thinks, yeah, I want to join in and I want to have my say, then I would love to hear in the chat box what you think optimism is. And I don't mean what I mean is what what category of thing is optimism. So in the way that a cucumber and an onion are both vegetables and a chair is a piece of furniture, what category of, of thing does optimism and indeed pessimism what category of thing do they belong to how would you describe them if you were describing them as nouns because what I'm going to tell you is that uh, however you whatever you would describe them as you're probably absolutely correct we all know what these things are but I also believe that optimism and pessimism are something else 
as well as what we typically think they are. So I'm going to give only just a tiny few seconds. Yes, exactly. Connie Robledo or Robledo. Sorry, my eyesight is bad. Connie Robledo has got it right. Uh, it's an attitude um, or a cast of mind. Yeah, a worldview, a way of life. Yes, it, it is all these things. But let's stick with attitude for a moment, because in relation to a future outcome that we haven't seen yet, optimism is an attitude. So it, it's an attitude in relation to what we think an outcome might be. So imagine you've been for a job interview or you've put an offer in on a house you want to buy and you haven't yet got the result. You don't know if you've got the job. You don't know if you were the highest sealed bidder on the house auction. So you're waiting for the result and you have no idea what it's going to be. So optimism and pessimism are attitudes that you might strike in relation to what you want to think about this or what you can't help thinking about this outcome that you're waiting for. Um, and what I've put here in, in terms of the, the sort of textbook definition, an attitude to the likelihood of a good versus a bad outcome. I think that's, I don't know what the dictionary says. I tend to ignore dictionary definitions these days uh, because when I looked up the dictionary definition of grudges or a grudge, I found that it was not at all similar to what I regard as a grudge. This led me to write an entire book, a self-help book called How to Hold a Grudge, in which I disagree with the dictionary about what grudges are. So since then, I've kind of ignored the dictionary and decided that, that I will just trust my own definitions instead. But I think an attitude to the likelihood of a good versus a bad outcome is a good definition of what optimism and pessimism are. So if you're an optimist, you will tend to believe that things will probably go well. And if you're a pessimist, you'll tend to believe that things will probably go badly. OK, what I want to, to suggest uh, today is that as well as being an attitude to whether things are likely to go well or badly, optimism is something else that is very important. And so is pessimism. But I'm not so to avoid having to say, and so is pessimism. Everything I'm going to say about optimism and what category of thing it belongs to applies to pessimism, too. So what might optimism be as well as an attitude to the likelihood of things going well or badly? OK, I also and as much as I regard it as an attitude, I also regard optimism as what I call an experiential result. So let's just first think about the category of results. If we sit an exam and we get a B or a C or an A, that's a result. If we take a driving test and we pass or fail, that's a result. Now think about it in the world of writing, which is the world that I come from. If I send my manuscript off to a publisher and I either get an acceptance or a rejection, that's a result. They're not, they are not, however, all of those things I've just described, they are not experiential results. Some of you may know, well, I know some of you know, because I've looked at who's here and I recognise some people who are in my Dream Author programme. For those of you who don't know what Dream Author is, I run a coaching programme for writers called Dream Author Coaching. So in my Dream Author Coaching uh, programme, I make a distinction between different types of results. There are the factual in the world, um, sort of outside of ourselves results. So receiving an email saying, we'd like to offer you the job. You were the successful applicant. That's an in the world external result. You get a certificate saying, congratulations, you've got an A in your biology A level, an external result, fail a driving test, external result. Most people, especially people who are regular high achievers, very successful people, very driven people, which I'm sure most of you are, um, because people who are not that driven don't tend to want to listen to talks about optimism. So I'm just guessing some of you may lounge around drinking martinis all day, not trying to achieve anything. But I reckon a lot of you are high achievers or on the way to being high achievers. Um, and if you are at all that kind of uh, type of person where you like you 
you have achievement and success as some of your most important values, then you will be completely accustomed to viewing results in terms of the in the world results. So what what do you, what accolades are you getting? What qualifi qualifications are you getting that you can tell people about and they'll go, oh, well done, that's amazing. Most high achievers tend to neglect their experiential results. And an experiential result is a very different thing from an external world result. And an experiential result, it's really just a fancy way of saying the experience you are having at any given time. So here I am talking to you. I'm excited and buoyed up about all the things I'm going to say to you. Like I, I'm so obsessed with all these things that I'm, you know, the things I've said already, the things I'm going to say. I can't wait to share them with you. I actually am looking forward to some of you writing in the chat. I don't agree you're wrong about everything, like, please feel free to not only put questions in the chat, but do, do tell me when you think I'm wrong about everything, because unlike most people one encounters these days, I love it when people disagree with me. Nothing excites me more than when someone says, everything you've just said is nonsense, and then I'm like, okay, game on, and then we get to have an interesting discussion. So please do tell me if and when you disagree. Um, Experiential results are the experience you are having in the moment. We're not accustomed to thinking of these as results. We are accustomed to thinking only of external world results belonging in the category of results. So um, if somebody said to you, so what results did you get today? Let's say they said that at the end of your day. And in fact, a good friend of mine whose marriage has since broken up which he's very grateful for. And so, so are everyone that knows him. But he used to be in this very suboptimal marriage where at the end of every day, his wife would say to him, did you have a productive day? And he used to hate that because he used to think, look, productivity is not the only criterion here. Why don't you ask me if I had a nice day? And this actually touches on the, the difference between experiential results and um, external results. So, um, if someone said to you, what results did you get today? You might say, you might think that they're asking, well, you know, what did you produce? Well, I, I finished chapter three of my book or I marked those exam papers or uh, I painted the whole living room and gave it an undercoat. So that's now done. We are used to answering results questions in terms of achievement. And there's lots of people in the world who, if they said to us, so, what great results have you had recently? If we answered that question by saying, well, I spent, you know, for the whole day today, I felt calm, at peace, really content, and just like very confident that I'm a great person. If we tried to present that to most people we knew as a result, they'd be like, yeah, that's not a result. You're just telling me how you've been feeling today. And of course, we all grow up in the world we grow up in. And we, you know, in order to make ourselves understood, we have to make words mean the same thing as other people make them mean in general. So like it's clear why that is the case. But what I want to encourage everyone to do is to start to think as much about experiential results as we think about external results, because so often we're so focused on the external results that are going to make it look to the world like we're achieving great things that we neglect. We don't, we don't even notice the fact that sometimes in order to get our consistently brilliant external results, we are creating for ourselves terrible experiential results as we go along. Um, and I, you know, I've done this myself. Uh, when I was finishing my fourth Poirot novel, I didn't start writing it soon enough uh, and that resulted in me having to finish it and hand it in because I didn't want to hand it in late. I had to finish it and hand it in during a week when I was also teaching a module of the Crime and Thriller Masters programme. What this meant was I was teaching and looking after students and performing and being a fun course director and whining and dining people. I was doing that from 9am till 10pm 
every day. And then at 10 p.m. I was finally finished for the day. I would go to my room and write 10,000 words. I wrote something like, I mean, maybe not 10, like six or seven, between 10 p.m. and four in the morning or five in the morning. Then I would sleep for two hours. Then I'd get up and another full day of teaching. I was able to feel OK about it because I told myself that I was like Bruce Willis in a hero movie where, you know, he had to do this incredibly difficult thing, but he was an amazing hero so he could do it. And I just kept telling myself I was an amazing hero. So my experiential results were not as bad as they could have been because I'm very good at coaching myself. But on the massive exhaustion front, my experiential results were bad. If I can only sleep for two hours a night, I'm someone who loves my sleep. That is a very, very bad experiential result. But I was thinking, I want the external result of handing the book in on time. And that's a really good illustration of experiential versus, um, versus external results. OK, so optimism. We need to start thinking about it as an experiential result as much as we think about it as an attitude. So. Let me give you another example of how I put this into practice. Um, I'm sure all of you can remember a time when you were wondering about the outcome of something. And because you so wanted the outcome to be great, you were worried that it wouldn't be. And so you spent maybe a week or two weeks or a month or two months thinking it's not going to work. Oh, it's all going to go wrong. And then I'm going to be so miserable. And anticipating that misery, you actually felt the misery and experienced it ahead of time before the result came in. Then the result comes in and it's like, oh, I got a good result. And you look back at those weeks of fretting and angst and all of that about the, the bad result that you were worried about getting. And you see how you've been experiencing anxiety and disappointment and misery completely unnecessarily. So, so your pessimism attitude, and I, I know that very often we can't help our attitude, you know, we, we just have a belief about whether things are likely to go well or badly. But what I'm trying to say is that that belief is so much more than just an attitude and a belief about whether it's going to work. It's also a consistent experiential result. So you apply for something you really want. You know that you're going to get the answer in 30 days. If you are thinking pessimistic thoughts for every day of those 30 days till the result comes in, you are going to have a miserable, disappointed, experiential result every day as you imagine this outcome that hasn't happened yet. And if you have an optimistic attitude, you could spend every one of those 30 days excited and happy imagining the great result you're going to get that you would, if you were an optimist, you would just believe you were going to get that great result. Now, I am in this exact situation and have been since 2017 or 18 in relation to a very specific thing. I have written two murder mystery musicals. Think of Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap, but with 13 catchy songs. That's the kind of vibe that my musicals have. Uh, or like Knives Out, the movie Knives Out with 13 catchy songs or 14 catchy songs. So I wrote this, these musicals and at a certain point, not immediately actually, but at a certain point after writing them, I started to think, actually, these are properly good. If these were on in a theatre, West End theatre or a Broadway theatre, people would love them. Like people would love them as much as they love Hamilton was what I thought. But remember, I'm an optimist. Optimism actually comes quite easily to me. So you know, that is my default setting is to think things like that. So I then thought, right, well, actually, what if I just believe that that's going to happen? What effect would that have? Well, the first effect it has is I feel amazing because I think, could my musicals be massive Broadway successes? Could they end up being as popular as Hamilton? If I decide to think, yes, they could, and I believe that they actually will, then I immediately get to experience some of the joy of that result, even though it hasn't happened yet. And so because I'm thinking my musicals could and will be as successful as Hamilton, and because I'm feeling that joy of the Hamilton level success, 
that completely changes the actions that I take in the world in relation to my musicals. So if I just thought, yeah, I've written these musicals, I mean, they're OK, they're probably not, they're probably not that good, probably I shouldn't bother anyone with them, then I might not be driven to take the action that would create any success. But because I long ago decided they could easily be as successful as Hamilton, and I then started to believe in that future, I start, you know, I regularly visit in my imagination the future era when my musicals are like so well known and so popular and I get some of the pleasure and happy feeling that I would have if that happened and when that happens right so what that means is it doesn't actually matter if and when it happens like I'm in no hurry for those musicals to do that I keep jokingly saying to people, one day I'm going to contact Cameron McIntosh. If anyone doesn't know who he is, he's a big musical theatre magnate. And like one day I'm going to get in touch with Andrew Lloyd Webber and say, hey, Andrew, you and I need to have lunch. Like I'm going to be so such a big cheese in the musical theatre world. You don't know it yet, but let's meet and I'll sing you all the songs from my musicals over lunch. So like that's on my list to do at some point when I'm less busy. At the moment, it would be difficult to squeeze Andrew in. Um, but I'm in no hurry because I'm already feeling the happy feelings that come from that result that I want. And it doesn't matter that the result isn't here yet. It doesn't even matter that the result may never happen. Like, I am not in any way saying, like, this is definitely going to happen. I'm not that delusional. But I choose on purpose to be a bit delusional in the optimistic direction because there is no downside. Now, when we think about optimism as an experiential result, that's when we see that there is literally no downside to it. So think of the thing that you're going to find out the outcome in 30 days. When choosing your attitude to how you want to think about that, the first thing to bear in mind is if I believe that the outcomes are going to be good and I keep visiting the future in my imagination, my imagined version of the future where things work well and go the way I want them to. If I spend the 30 days doing that, then I get the benefit of the success before it's happened. And even if it doesn't happen, in other words, like, why do we ever want to be successful if we try for something? Why do we want to succeed? Most of us probably don't ask ourselves that question, but the answer is always we want to succeed and we want to avoid failing because we want to feel something. We want to experience a particular emotion and our feelings are always caused by our thoughts. So we want to be able to think, yay, I'm a huge success and feel confident and successful and proud. That's the only reason we ever want success. Or we might sometimes want success to ward off the thought of, I never achieve anything good. I'm a waste of space and the feeling of worthlessness. That's another reason why people want to achieve. But it's always we want to achieve and create success so that we can feel the benefit of that in terms of an emotion. Probably none of us would strive to achieve anything if we knew for a fact that we were all going to be wrapped in a box for the rest of our lives and we would never know whether we succeeded or failed. You know, if someone said to me, carry on writing books, but we're going to lock you in a wardrobe and we're never going to tell you whether anyone read them, whether anyone liked them, <laughs> how many copies they sold. So they might be like the new Murder on the Orient Express and sell millions or they might sell zero copies and get terrible reviews and you will never know. How many of us would still want to achieve if we never got a the knowledge of a result? So why do we need that knowledge of the result? Because we want to feel a certain way. We want to think, yes, I did it and feel that good feeling. Now, when we think, yeah, it's going to work. It hasn't happened yet, but I believe in that future good result. We can feel ahead of time that brilliant thought and feeling combination. Now. I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, hang on a minute, it's not surely as simple as that because there is a downside, isn't there, to optimism? I don't think there is. I'm just pretending to be somebody sceptical at the moment. 
a lot of people would say, hold on a minute, you're encouraging people to feel and think optimistically for that 30 days or however long they're waiting for the result. But what if then a bad result arrives and they've got their hopes up by thinking unrealistically and then they get the result they didn't want? What about that? And people think this is a good argument. It's a terrible argument because after 30 days of thinking optimistically, believing in the great result, visiting that great result in your imagination in the future and benefiting from the thoughts and feelings that gives you, what you're doing there is creating a thought habit. And there's nothing our brains love more than to carry on operating in the way they always have. Brains love routine and habit because one of the brain's key motivators is to conserve energy. And it's so easy to just stay in the pattern you're in already. OK, so what actually happens, and I can tell you this 100 percent guaranteed because I've been an optimist all my life. If you think optimistically, believe in the great result for all that time and then it doesn't happen by that point, you are so firmly entrenched and ingrained with your optimistic thinking practice and you've experienced the benefits of it like so that you would never want to give it up. You just go, oh, OK, well, that didn't work out as I thought, but I've got this amazing optimism habit. Not going to let that go. So what else can I attach it to so that I can still carry on doing the good thinking? Um, you have to experience this in order to see how it works. I have had the brilliant experiential results based on this kind of optimistic thinking for most of my life, probably my whole life. And to me, it's just second nature. So I believe it's going to work. I believe it's going to work. I believe it's going to work. Then let's say on day 30 or day 400, I get a letter saying, dear Sophie Hannah, that thing you want is not going to work. This is an official no you have failed to achieve this thing, then it's almost like, oh yeah, this doesn't fit in with like the way I want the world to be. I want to think optimistically. So how can I still do that? And I just take my optimism and I attach it to something else. And this, this happened to me over and over again when I was trying to get published. I haven't always been a best-selling novelist. It took me a long time and loads of failure before I started to have some success. And that was what would happen. I would hope and I would believe and I would enjoy the experiential result of optimism, taking my thoughts and feelings from the future success that I was imagining. And then when the rejection letters started to pour in, there was no way I was giving up my nice feeling thought. So I just kind of went, oh, OK, on that occasion, it didn't work. But the next time it will. And in order to make sure it does, I need to change this, this and this about the book or I need to write a better book next time. And that is the, you know, people who favour pessimism would have us believe that the disappointment and the crushed feeling is so much worse if we haven't tried to kind of prepare for it with pessimistic thinking. The exact opposite is true. The exact opposite is true. All we're doing by believing pessimistically is ingraining very firmly a negative thought habit. Now, the same exact principle applies. If we practice thinking it's never going to work, I'm always going to be a failure, whatever, then when you get the great result, you're unable to enjoy it. Your brain immediately goes, well, this can't really be happiness or success. Because you've spent so long believing that that won't happen. So when it happens that the, our brains hate to be in a state of cognitive dissonance. Have you ever noticed that when a politician belonging to a party that you really, really hope will get into power and a politician in that party does something really quite grotty, but you love this party and everything that you've made it mean in your mind. And then a politician, maybe even the leader of that party, does a really grotty thing like he swears at a cute Labrador puppy, for example, your brain does not want to admit that the guy from the party you like has done a bad thing. So you make all the excuses. Now, if the party you really dislike, if that party has a leader that 
swears at a cute Labrador puppy, then you're like, look, everyone, what a terrible thing to do. What a terrible human being. Why do we behave like that? It's because our brains hate cognitive dissonance. They hate to, they hate to have any kind of awareness that they've maybe been getting their thinking all wrong and need to kind of start from scratch. That's so much effort. And our brain has three things that motivate it. The desire to seek pleasure, the desire to avoid pain, and the desire to conserve energy. That is the motivational triad of the brain. So when you're a pessimist and you get a good result, it doesn't make you happy because you want, you know, your brain wants to carry on thinking negatively. So being optimistic, because you are thinking and feeling higher quality, happier thoughts, because you're believing in this, this good future outcome, that creates a whole different range of actions from the actions you would produce if you were thinking pessimistically. And, you know, I, I see this in my own house on a regular basis. Like so often my husband and I will have a version of this conversation I will say, or he will say something like, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do X, Y, and Z? And I will go, well, if we want to, then we can. Let's like, why don't we ring up? Why don't you ring up now? Why don't we try and arrange it? And he will say, no, there's probably no point. No, it's probably too late. No, it probably won't work. And I will go, it's not too late. There is a point, it will work. And sometimes this creates really hilarious results. There was one time fairly recently where my husband came out of a cafe looking dejected and said, they said they can't sell me any coffees now because, you know, they're just really busy with the lunchtime rush. So they're just not doing takeaway coffees now. And I could imagine that he'd gone in and hovered around tentatively and maybe given off a vibe of, I'm someone who may or may not get a coffee out of this encounter. And I said, sit and watch and I walked in smiling full of energy 100% believing that I was going to get some coffee he'd literally been told five minutes earlier not doing coffee I said hello can I have a cappuccino and a latte to take out not a single murmur of complaint and I had my drinks and, and was out within five minutes um so let me just check my notes to check I'm not um leaving out anything really important. Okay, so I've talked about the experiential result factor. So that is the first thing to bear in mind that's so important. When you're thinking, do I want to sort of adopt an optimistic or a pessimistic outlook here? And you know, sometimes we can't control how we think about something, but we all have far more say in what we think about things than, we're, than we generally realize. So we could be aware that we were feeling pessimistic and think, hang on a minute, what thoughts am I thinking here? Are they true? What if I chose to think different thoughts to feel more optimistic? So once we start thinking like that, we can realize that our experiential results for the next 30 days or however long, in my case, it might be 30 years before my musicals are as successful as Hamilton, right? But however long it is, if every day we are believing and feeling great about that future success, we are going to have amazing experiential results. And the fact is, and, you know, please don't take my word for this, put it to the test and you'll start to see how true it is. The fact is that when we are thinking and feeling success, good result thoughts and emotions, we then are 500 times more likely to create the results we want. I can't remember who it was, but somebody famous said, whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're probably right. And that's a very um, convenient and shorthand way of saying exactly the point I'm making. What creates our, our external results in the world is the actions that are driven by our thoughts and feelings. That's all, that's all that create, I mean, okay, we have to interact with other people and they sometimes put a spanner in our works, but generally, we have so much control over the results we create and we create them by the combination of our thoughts and feelings. So it's what we make things mean and how that makes us feel. So a rejection letter from a publisher, I'll stick to this example because it's my field. When I got all those rejection letters as a teenager and in my early twenties, what I made them mean was, 
huh, clearly this particular instance isn't going to be the time when I massively succeed. But I definitely am going to be a successful writer one day. So I wonder how I'm going to end up creating that success. I thought it might work this time. It didn't. So what next? Because that's definitely happening. How am I going to make it happen? That is a very different mindset and attitude from, oh, I got a rejection letter. Maybe I just haven't got the talent. Maybe I'll never succeed. Lots of writers never succeed. The majority. I'm probably going to be one of them. The minute we start thinking like that, we feel disengaged, disempowered, despondent. And from that thought and feeling combination, we are not going to be fueled to take the necessary action to create success because often creating success takes an extremely long time but a that doesn't matter if you're ha if you're experiencing your future success ahead of time doesn't matter how long it takes there's no urgency we don't need to succeed in order to solve a negative emotion we're not experiencing the negative emotion because we're believing in our future success so who cares when it like I don't have time to go to Broadway now and watch my musical. So I'm glad it's only going to happen in 10 or 20 years time. My first musical is being made into a movie. That was one of the byproducts of me going around saying it's amazing and it's as good as Hamilton, right? Somebody went, oh, I mean, she's biased, but what if she's right? Then they investigated, then they loved the musical, then they decided they want, wanted to make it into a movie. But if I'd been shuffling about going, I've written this musical, it's probably crap. Nobody would have said, show me your musical, let alone an exciting film director, right? So our thoughts create our feelings, create our actions, create our results. So optimism is not only a guarantee of brilliant experiential results, it's also a massive increase of the odds that you'll get a good result. Now, so let's just talk about belief for a minute because I've been talking about how we can choose to believe optimistically rather than pessimistically. And I want to talk about the nature of that belief, because it's a very particular kind of belief and it's not the normal kind. And if we think of belief in the context of what I'm saying, like believe that you're going to get the amazing result you'd most like to get. Most people would think, hang on a minute, how can I believe that when there's no evidence to suggest it, right? So I could say to you, I believe that I'm holding a green and white spotty mug. And if you said, well, I don't believe that, I could go, uh, look, there it is. I've got some proof. I can prove to you that that's the case. If someone says, well, I think, I think, you know, strep cells can cure leukemia, then someone could go, okay, let's do a trial. I'm afraid that didn't work. Go and do some doctor training. We are used to talking about belief in terms of evidence and what we can prove. And so when you try and, you know, put forward optimistic, um, when, you, when you try and sort of endorse and promote optimistic thinking, people say, well, hang on a minute. You're saying believe you can be a huge success or believe whatever you want to believe, but there's no evidence that I can. Now, that's true. But there is also no evidence that you won't. We have to think about belief differently when we're talking about a future result that doesn't exist yet. The truth is there is no way of predicting what the future is going to contain. We can make some guesses like I guess and believe that the sun is going to rise tomorrow morning. That's kind of based on what's always happened and the laws of physics and that kind of thing. In terms of what result we're going to get from something that we want to achieve and where the result hasn't come in yet, let alone what we're going to create further in the future, there's just no way of knowing. Is any of us going to become an Olympic level snooker player? We don't know. I don't know whether snooker is in the Olympics. Let's pretend it is. Any of us could. Most of us probably won't. But about any of us as individuals, we don't know whether we are or aren't going to. Let's say we all want to. We all want to become a gold medalist at snooker in the Olympics. We don't know whether we're going to do that. So there is no evidence to support a belief about a future result. Looking at past results tells us nothing. 
Our future results are only going to resemble our past results if we carry on thinking and feeling the same. If we change our thoughts radically and create new feelings, then our actions will be completely different and our results will be completely different. So we just can't predict. So when people say, you know, I often I tell everyone I meet that my musicals are as successful as Hamilton and they first say, no, they're not because I've never heard of your musicals. And I say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is in the future I'm talking about. And they say, you're delusional. And I am delusional. But here's the thing. People who are busy imagining future failures are just as delusional. And so it's a question of which delusion do you want to pick? Why not pick the one that has you feeling great and maximizes your chances of creating the very success that you want to create? OK, I am now going to just look at my notes and check that there's nothing. Hmm. I actually said all the things that were in my notes. I was not optimistic that I would manage to do that, but I have. Now, I'm just going to tell you a teeny little story before I open up for questions and uh, or violent disagreement. You know, feel free to say here's why you're wrong about everything. As I say, that is fine. Um, but I'll tell you this tiny story that illustrates that I practice absolutely what I preach. In 2013, a very, very clever but desperately broke mate of mine had an idea for a scientific invention that he wanted to invent. And he actually had this idea because I told him to. He told me he was working for this scientific company. I said, don't work for a company. Don't be a salaried employee. Invent an amazing thing that the world really needs form your own company and make millions selling it to, I don't know, Intel or GlaxoSmithKline. And he was like, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. Anyway, he went away and thought about it and he came up with an amazing invention. He rang me and said, I've had this amazing idea. I want to invent this thing, but there's only one problem. I've got no money. I've got minus money. In order for this to work, I have to attract at least 30 million in venture capital. And in order to do that, I need seed capital. Now, I had never heard of seed capital at this point. I was a detective novelist and a poet. Didn't even know what seed capital was. Anyway, he explained to me that what he meant was he wanted me to give him some money. And I decided to do it because I was like, it was kind of my idea. And if it works, he, he was offering me like a huge number of shares in this company that didn't yet exist if I gave him the seed capital. And I just thought, yeah. The odds of it working out are slim. He told me that. He said, this is 99% likely to fail because most startups do. So you may well, almost guaranteed, in fact, that you will lose your money. And I was like, I don't care. I'm in for the chance of winning big. That's an exciting thing to do. And I want to support you. So I'm in. So he came around one day and I wrote him a large check. Soon as I'd written him the large check and he went home, I picked up my laptop and I went on, can anyone guess? Right move. And I started looking on Right Move for mansions in the California area costing between 10 and 20 million dollars. And um, I found one that I really liked. <laughs> And I was excited about this company that might be a huge success. So I, I copied and pasted the link to this like $15 million mansion. And I sent it to Luke, my scientist friend, with a message saying, look at this mansion. This is the kind of thing we'll be able to buy if this company goes huge and takes off. He rang me up immediately, sounding terribly worried. And he said, Sophie, get off right move. Did I not impress on you enough? This is very, very likely to fail. Do you want me to bring back your check? Have you misunderstood? I was like, relax. I said, I haven't misunderstood. I know that, that, you know, it might work, it might not. But what I can do immediately is start having a great experiential result. I didn't put it like that because uh, he is not a coachy person. He's a scientist. Anyway, that was 2013. Last year, the company um, kind of like we had an opportunity to sell all our shares. At that point, the company was worth 3.5 billion pounds. 
it was the biggest success. It, it was a unicorn. Everything went brilliantly. The odds were against that happening, but it happened. Now, he, Luke, only started to believe it was actually going to happen long after the success was already beginning. And, you know, he even like a year earlier, he was like, something could still go wrong. I was believing in that success and having the fun of experiencing it ahead of time from the second I handed over that seed capital. So like, I'm still, you know, obviously then I sold my shares and it was, it's all amazing, but I was having that amazingness experience from 2013 with no guarantee it would work. Now, what if last year, instead of what actually happened, someone had rung me and said, oh, actually, Jeff Bezos has closed down the company. He's somehow taken it over to close it down and everyone's lost all their money and the company doesn't exist. Would it have been, would I have been like, oh, no, this is so much worse because I've had all this fun imagining the success? No, it'd be like, oh, well, I tell you what, I have spent, you know, seven years having an amazing time in my head partying in California mansions that I don't yet own. It's been a blast. I would not, I don't regret that for a second. Right. What's the next thing I can believe in that I can feel great about? That is what I would have done. That is how I would have felt. Uh, so that's just a little kind of real time anecdote that just shows. And now one tiny little, little thing. Once we all sold our shares, I sent him another link and I was like, do you remember you told me that I shouldn't send links like this or even be looking on right move. He still didn't like it. <laughs> he was like, stop. I've got my four bedroom house that I now own outright. Thanks to the sale of the shares. That's good enough for me. Don't send me pictures of mansions. Interesting, right? Because he's had a certain thought habit. I don't, I don't even know what his thoughts are, but they're probably something along the lines of, People definitely shouldn't buy mansions if they're serious about changing the world and being good people or whatever he believes. But a massive injection of money into his bank account didn't change his thought pattern. Um, so I hope I have made a convincing case. Now, let me see if anyone has a question. Have I always been an optimist or is it something I've learned? No, I, I have a very fortunate natural tendency to be optimistic but I have certainly honed and consolidated my optimism and the thing that's really changed for me recently ish actually so in 2013 it wasn't only that friend of mine Luke who started the company everyone I knew was going don't count your chickens you'll only be disappointed why have you given this guy all this money you're strange and silly like I, there was lots of condemnation coming my way and People, I, I used to think I'm just a bit weird. I'm obviously not a sensible person. I'm obviously not a, you know, I'm obviously a bit of a fool, but I'm happy being a fool, believing in my nice things. That was what I used to think. And then I, I you know, because of a range of experiences that I haven't got time to go into detail about, I suddenly went, hang on a minute. I'm not a fool. My strategy it's just the best strategy for everyone because we can all be having these amazing experiential results. There is literally no downside to assuming the best will happen rather than the worst. Um, Matthew says, isn't optimism your 17 year old self believing you'll be a great author and trying again and again to write? Yes, that was optimism, but self delusion is your current self still sending the stories you wrote when you were 17 to more and more publishers and believing one day someone will recognize your talent? Excellent point, Matthew. So optimism that doesn't include realism and sensible strategy is um, less likely to create you good results. You're, you could still have an amazing time sitting around thinking that one day someone will recognize the genius of the story you wrote when you were 17. What's more useful is to think, I believe I can do it, but how can I always be honing my strategy and the specifics of my approach? 
And a key part of that is looking at what's working and what's not working. Um, it's interesting, actually, because I um, there was another company I invested in and they had a strategy. They were doing so well, but they had a strategy that was really not working. They wanted to keep all the shares for the initial shareholders. And every time we had a meeting, I kept saying, don't try and like don't have a scarcity mindset and not want to go to venture capitalists because we need a big influx of cash regularly to meet all the demand because they were getting huge orders for their product. They were just not willing to share the pie. And in the end, that company went bankrupt. Um, so you have to, there's a, there's a saying, it was, I didn't invent it, a woman called Megan Hyatt Miller said it, hold your goals and dreams tightly and your strategies loosely. So whatever your dream is, you never have to give up on trying to make that happen. But if, for example, you try 15 times to get a job at um, Apple, let's say, and after every interview, the feedback is, don't come in wearing your pyjamas. We're never going to give a job to someone who interviews in pyjamas. Then it would be foolish not to change into, into day clothes for your next interview with Apple. So that's a really, really good point. Um, I suppose my question about the above is, have you ever su suffered from low self-esteem? Um, I don't think I have. I don't think I have ever suffered from low self-esteem. And I know a lot of people do. And I think that is something, you know, there are various temperamental and environmental things that, uh, that make us either someone with low self-esteem or high self-esteem. Um, I mean, I don't, I can't pretend to know what is the cause of either, but I think if you grow up in a family that clearly values you and loves you and thinks you're great, you are more likely to have high self-esteem. But that kind of makes it easier to have it. But that doesn't mean that if you have low self-esteem, you, you sort of have to go, oh, well, they can do it because they have high self-esteem. I can't because I have low self-esteem. Instead, we can recognise that thinking badly of ourselves or, or feeling unworthy in ourselves is just a learned thought habit. Most of us do learn lots of thought habits from our family of origin. And the sensible thing to do is when you're a grown up, you can look at all the beliefs you've kind of acquired from your upbringing and your schooling and your training so far. And you can think, well, this is a useful one. Definitely want to keep this this is not such a useful one. In fact, it's, it's nonsense. I'm going to ditch this. So all of us have the option to decide that we are 100% worthy and that we can therefore esteem ourselves. Nobody, in my opinion, nobody is better or worse or worth more or less than anyone else. And that includes brilliant, helpful people in the world and people who do terrible things, their actions differ hugely. But in terms of their innate worth as humans on this planet, everyone is equally worthy, I believe. So I'm in favour of like choosing on purpose everything we want to think and believe and then getting into the habit of practising those thoughts that are going to make us feel better rather than worse. Sophie, that seems like a wonderful place to stop because we are now at seven o'clock. And um, I mean, thank you. Thank you so much. Fascinating, um, uplifting, inspiring. I mean, really, really wonderful. I think, you know, many people have enjoyed it and you can see from, from the chat. Um, we absolutely believe in the future of your murder mystery <laughs> musicals and uh, I wish you all the best. They sound absolutely fabulous. Um, thanks so much for your support. Um, of Lucy Giving Week, um, that's hugely appreciated. And just to say to everybody who is who is listening, um, Lucy Giving Week ends on Sunday at 6 p.m. Um, so we've got three days left and um, in the spirit of optimism, <laughs> please click on that link and help us to carry on with the college's uh, brilliant work. Uh, but firstly, uh, lastly rather, just to say to Sophie, thank you so much for giving us your time today. Fantastic, thanks so much everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.